say hey it's just me hi um it's about four minutes before we start we just started the live stream just so that people know um to the youtube channel and we'll be back with you in just a minute <laughs> Okay, hi everybody. This is Lori Petrie. I am representing the Everett Rail Marshall Public Library tonight and um, we're welcoming Madeline. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself before you get started with your presentation? Yeah, of course. Um, I graduated from Marshfield High School in 2016 and I think this month I've been here with my family obviously for about 19 years. Um, and I left to go to um, Chicago at Loyola for undergrad with a major in history and a minor in English and came home for the pandemic and decided grad school was my best option. So we've um, been doing public history since the pandemic started. That's and great. I've been volunteering at the Upper Mansion for I think about 10 months now. A lot of good experience. And thank you for coming today and thank you all for joining us and I'll let you take it, take it over. 
Awesome. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. PowerPoint, hopefully. Okay. Um, so behind closed drawers, uh, the garment in, the garments found in the Northwood County Historical Society's um, clothing inventory. Boy, here we go. Okay. So the past year at the Apple Mansion, according to the intern. <laughs> um, so. We've done inventory. I didn't start the inventory. There were um, several volunteers and Kim that started it and laid the groundwork for it all um, before I came in, I think, mid-September. Um, and then you know, they were also doing tours by appointment. Um, I wasn't doing tours. I was just doing the inventory and exploring all the cool clothes. Um, and then we did more inventory and then the pie and ice cream social, um, which I helped with. I helped um, cut pies and wherever I was needed. Um, and the pie and ice cream social kind of marked a, the, a step away from, um, from the inventory and into working on a variety of different things, most of which have been kind of inspired by Marshfield's 150th anniversary coming up in 2022. Um, and before I get any further, I should probably mention that I'm not an expert. I'm, um, I've done some research on uh, garments inspired by a sewing hobby that I rediscovered during the pandemic, as so many of us did. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And um, if I get something wrong, please feel free to correct me. I'm here to learn just as you are. <laughs> So I um, narrowed down the inventory steps to um, five, five main steps. So we identify the garment and hopefully find a catalog number for it. Um, we enter that information into Excel. Um, then we take a photograph of it. Um, and then we do a preservation step and storage. Um, the way I've structured this talk is kind of around these steps. Um, so I'll break down what we do during each step. And I will also highlight um, a garment that we have in our collection. Um, probably one that I think is pretty cool. It's what has been happening. And a lot of them are based off of the exhibit that we have up um, on the second floor right now. Um, and this garment is, I believe it's a child's um, dress. I think it's an FIC, so founding collection. We'll learn a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but the embroidery on this is what caught my eye. I've been loving that. Um, so the first step is to identify the garment. And I kind of feel a little bit like Sherlock Holmes when I do this initial inspection. And I've learned a lot of things about garments. That's how I've done it, at least. Um, and we hope to find a deed of gift that goes with it or a name associated to it can get us to a deed of gift. Um, so the deed of gift is um, a document that anyone who donates something should have to do. Um, and it kind of, it just outlines who you are, what you're donating, and any information you have about it. And that enables us to give it an accession number, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this garment right here, um, I believe it is an FIC, but the men's coats I found kind of cool to look at. Um, there are lots of surprise pockets for me because I don't wear men's clothes typically. Um, but here you can see a pocket, um, this little white strip right here, and there's another one over here. And I did a bit of research on it. I couldn't quite figure out what it was for. So if you know, let me know. But in this pocket over here, there's actually a wad of fabric, which I believe is just extra um, coating material. But um, one of my <laughs> fears I have learned is, um, plunging my hands blindly into pockets of old garments. Um, so that has been, we have slowly conquered that, but especially in the case of all the three piece suits that we have. Um, and here we are looking at um, a suit that was worn by William Uthmeyer. Um, and inside the pocket of those, these, these are the pants of the suit, but inside the pockets of the um, pants and the jacket, there are, tags like this, and you have the tailor, the city, and then who it was made for, in this case, Mr. William Uthmeyer, and the date it was made, which is February 8th, uh, 1911, so that's over 110 years ago. Um, and this has actually been really nice for identifying garments 
just because we have a name to connect to it. And once off the rack suits became a thing, it gets a little bit more tricky to nail down who it's um, related to. But um, the Uthmeyer family came to Wisconsin in the 1880s, I believe, and they were involved in a variety of businesses in the central Wisconsin area. Um, before Mr. Uthmeyer opened the Uthmeyer Hints uh, general store on North Central Avenue here in Marshfield. Um, so the accession number for this, we were able to trace it back based on the last name, is um, 2002.03.02 A, B, and C. Um, so 2002 is the year that it was donated to us. Uh, the 03 is the number of donation it was that year. And 02 is the number with uh, object within that donation. And then the A, B, and C um, tells me that it's, there are three parts to this donation. Um, so the end of step one results in this tag over here on the hanger. Um, this hanger is an ideal and we'll get into that later. Um, and then there are smaller tags <clears throat> on each of the garments as well, usually attached to a buttonhole. And if there's not that, then um, placed in a pocket. Um, but the three piece suit, um, fun fact, was developed by King Charles II of England in 1666. Well, someone developed it for him, obviously, but he liked it. So he made sure everyone in his court was wearing it and he was wearing it. It was just the hot thing that year. Um, shortly after King Louis XIV of France made the three piece suit the official uniform for his footmen and servants as a joke, but um, it's a little funny because who's laughing now? Um, men's fashions have not changed too much in the past 300 plus years. <laughs> um, so um, if there's not a connection in the case of this dress, then we give it an FIC, which is short for found in collection, followed by the year and then the number um, of garment that that is that we're missing or that not missing, but that doesn't have a connection of that year. So in this case, this was the ninth one, which means I, it was processed fairly early on in January. Um, this is actually a cool seersucker dress. The I should note that um, any mannequin pictures in this, all the mannequins are probably a little bit too big for these garments. Um, but this is a faux wrap dress and it has pockets, um, which pockets and dresses are cool, especially when they're historical dresses. Um, yeah. So step two is entering the information into Excel. And there are five columns to fill, um, the catalog number, garment description, donor, notes, and location. And we'll get a bit more into that on the next slide. Um, but here is a smoking jacket. Um, as you can see, it was Mr. Fred K. Camps. It was donated to the Historical Society in 1996 by Chris Buchanan. Um, Fred Camps was a businessman in Marshfield. He co-owned Default Camps Mercantile Company with his brother. The business was sold in 1923 following his brother's death. Um, when we were, when Kim and I were um, trying to decide what garments to feature in this, she reached out to Chris to just to see if we could get a more exact um, dating on it. And uh, Chris says she remembers seeing her grandfather wear this. So we think it's from the 30s or the 40s, maybe a little bit later. Um, so it's always fun to hear about little personal connections like that. So this is the Excel sheet. Um, it's, there are lots and lots of pages like this. I outlined the entry that we are looking at um, right here. And this goes to the smoking jacket we just saw on the previous page. Um, it was donated in 1996. It was the 19th donation of that year and it was the 11th object in that donation. That's the catalog number um, column. And then the description is where we describe it. Um, and it's mostly me describing what I see and trying to do some research to figure out what I'm describing. Um, because of my little sewing hobby that I picked up, I've learned some sewing terms so I can kind of identify different types of cuffs and pleats and um, um, lapels. But uh, so it goes through stages. You'll notice if you ever read through it, it sometimes be really detailed and then other times it'll just be dress with full skirt. Um, and then we see over here that Chris Buchanan donated it 
And then in the notes is where we would note anything like um, if it needs a new hanger, like this object does. Um, so that typically means it needs a non-wooden hanger or a padded hanger, which we'll hear about in a bit. And then location over here, um, we see that it's in Mr. Upham's room. So that means that it's in the closet and then the LL signifies that it's on the lower rack um, on the left side. And then there's a left upper rack, a right upper rack and a right lower rack. After Excel, we take a photograph of the object. These are the Uthmeyer pants we saw earlier. Um, you can see the little whiteboard down here with the number on it. And this is mostly for our own reference. Um, I think there should be somewhere between four and 500 images from the whole inventory from before I got there. And there will be a lot more after I'm gone, I'm sure. But the purpose of the photograph is that it makes it easier for us to um, figure out what a number is referring to um, so we don't have to dig through the closets to refresh our memory. It also makes it easier for researchers if anyone ever wants to see something specific. Um, we can just send them a picture and say, if you need better quality pictures, feel free to come in or let us know. Um, and then between the Excel step and this step, I learned or rediscovered rather that I'm really bad with numbers. <laughs> um, it's resulted in a lot of headaches and laughs, possibly more laughs. Um, it created some puzzles of our own. Some garments have pictures with the same number and they don't have any, it's, yeah. Um, but we are working on that. <laughs> so our next step is uh, preservation. Um, and there are four main components to this, I have realized. Um, Acid-free tissue paper, acid-free boxes, garment covers, and padded hangers. Over on the right, we will see a picture of um, a pair of shoes that we found in the inventory. They were donated um, by Marge uh, Heydrich. And they, I believe they're from the early 1900s. Um, I found them a little hard to date, if you know, let me know. Um, but you can kind of see the beading and then like the way the leather has just molded and then the, the sole of the shoe is really cool too. But then you also see tissue paper in it and that's acid-free tissue paper and provides a bit more um, support for the shoe because um, it's fairly fragile and can fall over a bit. But when we found um, the shoe collection, most of the shoes either had newspaper or plastic in them. And that's um, bad for not just shoes, but all garments. Um, it tends to uh, degrade, degrade um, damage, uh, destroy the garments, the objects. Um, some other ways it can do this is like shattering from silk um, is worsened by these things. Uh, historical sh silk um, often shatters because uh, it was sold, silk was sold by its weight. So people would add chemicals to it to make it heavier, but those chemicals damage the garment in the long run, unfortunately. And then heavy beaded garments that aren't hangers also struggle because they're heavy and the seams are not super strong slash meant to last a hundred years. <laughs> um, moth holes stretching from being on hangers, uh, creases from folds and shoes. Um, but luckily there are ways to prevent this. So we've discussed the tissue papers with the shoes. And the next one is um, boxes. Instead of having things hanging, they can go into a box, um, acid free preferably, but if we can't get our hands on acid free, we go for, um, uh, we'll line it with acid free tissue paper. Um, but boxes aren't cheap. Um, some of you might remember the um, adopt a wedding dress event that uh, Kim and the rest of the board put on a few years ago. Um, wedding dress boxes from the um, archival company that we prefer are about $65 at like base, like bottom. Um, and then other dress slash garment boxes, which are smaller and not quite as big as wedding dress boxes are right around 30, usually a little bit more, depending on what you need. Um, shoe boxes are about 20, hat boxes are about 20. Um, so I feel like I should be asking for donations right here, but, um, and then the other way that we um, could use help is with, um, if you need something to replace your stress-induced mask sewing, um, 
I have sewed a handful of garment covers um, and I'm currently working on a pattern. It's four straight lines. It, it's, I, I don't sew well, I could, I could do it. <laughs> um, and we will provide the fabric and the string, obviously. Um, it has to be an undyed special cotton muslin. Um, but we will have a pattern soon, hopefully. <laughs> and then the same thing goes for padded hangers. Um, it's a lot nicer and easier on the garment um, to have that extra padded padding. And the um, batting that a lot of people use in quilts is perfect for this. Um, we have found, so if you have larger scraps, we'll take them, I think. <laughs> Um, but the wood hangers um, that we saw earlier also cause damage to um, and discoloration to the garments that they're holding. And the way that a lot of skirts are stored with the little pinchy hangers, um, the rubber will leave residue on the garments, which is not ideal. So we try to put them in boxes where we can. Um, and then Another challenge is storage. Um, <laughs> at present, everything, this is very typical for um, historic, small town historical societies I've learned from other people in my um, graduate program, but um, a lot of our things are in dressers lined with acid-free tissue paper. Um, we have closets. I meant to take pictures of those. I thought I had some because they look really pretty and I'm really proud of the work that we've done. Um, and then we also have shelves of boxes and boxes under beds and yeah. <laughs> so this is a picture of what we have on exhibit right now. Um, we'll see a dress from 50s-ish over here, a pair of overalls that Marilyn Hine donated. And then this is our most, one of our more recent donations in 2021. I think it was our second or third, it's a pair of hunting pants. Um, and then we have the overalls and I've, one of the reasons I've loved looking at clothes is just to see how everything was repaired constantly. As you can see up here on the thigh and then down here where everything was folded. Um, and this garment also shows how uh, folding garments isn't great because these pants have been hanging for the better part of, I think like a month and the folds are still there. So it would be ideal if those would have been baffled with tissue paper, which is essentially just accordion folding, um, accordion folding tissue paper so that the creases aren't quite as harsh. Um, and then over here is just a shirt with a button strip and a cool placket. Um, and then this, um, this outfit constantly, like I, every time I see it, I'm continually just struck by the detail because it was all hand done. It um, was donated by the Rodis, Rodis family. Um, and the boning in here is all hand done, um, which I think is impressive because it's, that's just a tiny side of it and it's all around the garment and then the rich velvet purple and the pleats down here and the brocade pattern that we have going on up here and just, it's, it's cool. <laughs> and the shirt is actually an FIC. Um, we couldn't get the jacket to fit on the mannequin. The mannequin, mannequin was a little bit too big. Um, it was actually way too big <laughs> um, for the jacket. So it's hanging behind it. So you have to use your imagination when you see it a bit. And then the next uh, collection that I have been fascinated with is the Adler collection. Um, I haven't even seen all of the Adler stuff, I believe, but everything that's in here is really amazing. Um, this dress I believe was worn by Betty Adler. Um, I I think it's from the, I know it looks 20s, but I think it was 30s, um, possibly very early 40s. Um, this mannequin was also too big for the dress. And then up here, there would have been um, another sheet of like silk or something covering this button area, um, judging from the snaps that are in it. Uh, this garment is also like a puzzle to put on. Um, took me a couple tries to get it and <laughs> standing there. Uh, but then this is a close-up of the beading, which I found really impressive as well. I, the beading is another thing that gets me whenever I see it in a garment. We have several of those that just struck by. And this is a pair of shoes that was donated by the Adler family and their original box. The S8 over here is something I put on it so that we can identify each box. Um, 
what's in it and so we can find a pair of shoes without opening every single shoe box under the bed. <laughs> um, and then, so before we launch into questions, um, these are just a few pictures that I had on my phone from various uh, days at the Upper Mansion. Um, I volunteering at the Upper Mansion has been an amazing experience and it's not only fascinating to see all the clothes and artifacts, but it's also really cool to see the companies that used to be in Marshfield. Like uh, this, I believe this hat is purchased, was purchased from a company in Marshfield. This one I believe was from a place in Chicago in the fifties. Um, there are several other hats in the collection. We haven't done an inventory on hats yet. That's next on the list um, that, uh, that are from Marshfield as well, as long as several other um, garments like have Marshfield in them and that's just not something you're used to seeing in any town, um, but especially having grown up in Marshfield the last 20 years. But uh, on that note, I met with my advisor earlier today and he reminded me how unique of an experience uh, this internship has been because it's enabled me to learn more about the community that I grew up in, but also its history and like what it was and how it came to be. And it's just been fascinating at every step of the way. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank Kim for this experience and answering my seemingly endless questions about everything. So thank you. Thank you for sharing with us, Madeline. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can either add that in the chat, chat or in the Q&A, and we'll start taking those now. Okay, so I guess I'll take the first question. <laughs> um, I see, I mean, I know that the, that you, they've been working with um, books as well as the clothing items there. Um, how full is that area? I haven't been in the Up and Mashin for a while. So how full is that getting to be? The book area? Or? All of it. Oh, um, it's pretty full. Um, <laughs> we, at the beginning of the, um, of the inventory. I wasn't there for that. And Kim did a couple of videos and edited them and they're all on the Historical Society's YouTube channel. You should definitely look at those. Um, but the everything was crammed into the um, north bedroom closet and we've taken all that out, properly spaced everything. And we have two racks left over, I believe, um, that we need to find space for. <laughs> um, so it's clothing is full if we want to store it properly. Okay, I have a question from Don, and he asked, "What is the most what is the most surprising find?" Um, pretty early on, I went through the hats, and I. The feathered hat pictured here just keeps coming back to me. I couldn't tell you why. Um, I think it's really cool. But then there's also um, in the dresser, um, in the little alcove before you go into the bathroom upstairs on the top drawer, there's like these little mink faces, mouse face looking things that are just right there on the top of the drawer the first time I opened it jumped but it's attached to a scarf thing that I should know the word for. <laughs> okay the next question comes from Catherine she says I'm the great-granddaughter of the upstairs maid in the, the upper mansion. Go ahead and change a bunch. I'm sorry. No. Okay, and she says she's also a costume historian and I am considering launching a YouTube channel on heritage sewing to support my authorship. Ooh, <laughs> that's exciting. She also says, I'm excited to see actual clothing that my ancestors might have seen. <laughs> That's also been a really cool experience or part of this. Um, just, and then when you see pictures too of people in the garment, especially the wedding dresses, since I didn't get to see um, those or I haven't seen those yet, but I've seen a couple of pictures. 
She, uh, Catherine again, she says, I have a fundraising idea for you. I have purchased some of the recreational patterns from the Wisconsin Historical Society that were patterned from excellent clothing. Um, the sand, this question is from Lori. She says, have all of the clothing items been inventory? If not, what would you estimate the number of items left to be when, what would you estimate the number of items left to be inventory? Um, we haven't done the hats yet, um, men's or women's, and we haven't done men's shoes. Um, uh, frankly, I, I don't know, but I know that the bulk of it is done. <laughs> and there are always bits and bobs, you know, that pile. Look, I'm jumping to Kim because she says purses need to be done as oh, well. Yes. Purses and accessories, yes. Those are also really cool. <laughs> awesome. Okay, this is back to Catherine. She said, would you consider developing patterns from garments and offering them via uh, PDF or perhaps uh, self-publishing the photos from the collection and selling it? That could be really cool. Yeah. Um, my pattern development skills tap out at garment bags with four straight lines, <laughs> but um, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> so I know there's a huge uh, historical sewing community online that I've found through trying to identify various garments. <laughs> Okay. Bra uh, Lori says, bravo for the work you've done. Thanks for helping move this project forward. Oh, of course, I am not the only volunteer working on this. There were several with me and many before me and Kim through it all. <laughs> Natalie says, very interesting. I think the hats would tell quite a story too. And thank you. Okay, so I have a question through the chat here. Um, have there been questions from local theater groups on what type of costume should be used? This is from Barb. Um, that's an excellent question um, that I think Kim would be better suited to answer. I've only been here during the pandemic when <laughs> theater has been kind of quiet. <laughs> um, but I would imagine that the Historical Society would be a great resource for that. <laughs> Kim um, has uh, sent us a couple things. She says it's uh, there's so many stories and that no one has connected with us specifically for that. Okay, back to Catherine. She said, I saw one, one of your YouTube videos that are that there are some items that look 18th century, it's too bad that it is such a long commute from Orion or I'd help. <laughs> and then she wanted to know what the oldest one that you found. Ooh. Um, oh. Definitely 1800s. Um, this might be one of them. There's There was this collection of uh, shirtwaists that were really cool to look at. Um, I couldn't give you an exact date. <laughs> So you, you showed that one dress with all the, the boning in it. Is that mm -hmm. your favorite dress? One of them, yeah. That's another one that keeps um, coming back into my mind when I think about the dresses I've worked with. That's definitely It's very one. beautiful. I understand. It, <laughs> it has 18 buttons that I imagine. Um, all the buttons are missing, but there's 18 buttonholes. Um, but I would think that they were covered with velvet and just like a world where people wore that. I think that was just so cool. <laughs> oh, you mentioned that um, the mannequins that you have are too big for the costumes uh, is or clothing. Is there a way that you can source the smaller, smaller mannequins or is it just people not? Um... I, I think a lot of it is that these are um, more modern mannequins than the um, garments and bodies have changed a lot since the 1800s. Um, and some of the uh, mannequins are adjustable, but they don't 
go quite small enough. Like the mannequin in the north bedroom that has the black skirt suit with the orange and teal beading on it, uh, that one's adjustable. And I think it's, I don't think it's as small as it can go because I think it's still bigger than the smallest mannequin we have. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Uh, Catherine asked, did you see the boning? Is the whale bo is there whale bone in that purple outfit? I don't know if it's whale boning. Um, I, you can't really see any of it. It's all fabric covered. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, Kim, Kim dropped in and said, uh, dress forms can be made if we need to, but they're very expensive. And Catherine came up with another one, said the mannequin idea, there are DIY mannequins that you can sew and stuff yourself. That might be fun to sew up custom ones for your collection. Another yeah. great idea. Yeah. <laughs> she says, check out bootstrap patterns for mannequins. Ooh, I'm writing that down. <laughs> Oh, it looks like they're on Etsy. Okay. So do we have any other questions for Madeline? Madeline, sorry, I said it wrong. Well, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge with us tonight, and I have learned a lot. I'm not sure everyone else has, but I'm sure they they felt like it was very informative. Don just said, nice job. So that's kind of nice to hear. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed looking at the beautiful things that we have just down the road from here. <laughs> All of this is in Marshfield, and there are other ways to volunteer, too, if clothing isn't your thing. <laughs> Kim always says we can find something that'll fit you. <laughs> so you're getting lots of kudos from everybody and then nice job, new information, very lovely and exciting. And thank you for sharing. So um, with that, I'd like to end the program tonight. And um, do you have any closing words for us? Thank you for coming and thank you for listening. And thank you for sharing all of your ideas as well. I'm here to learn. <laughs> Thank you all.